Bon, je voudrais remercier. I would like to uh, express my gratitude to Anne France, to Martin, uh, to Jonathan, and to all the organizers of the activities of the Institut d'Etudes Anciennes Medieval. Um, this invitation is really a great privilege for me and um, an extraordinary opportunity for discussing uh, my research work, especially since I hope to get uh, some feedback on the topics that I'm going to present. Um, before starting, let me just briefly introduce what I would like to discuss with you and how I have decided to structure my talk. Um, to begin with, I thought that it might be useful to spend some words on what exactly an epigraphic forgery is and how uh, this category of inscribed monu monuments and documents has been assessed so far. Um, in the second part of my presentation, I will focus specifically on a case study offered by a group of forged um, inscribed uh, bronze tablets to which I have recently devoted my attention. Um, so I'm going to start my presentation with a thought-provoking quote by a celebrated Italian-Canadian archaeologist, Gilbert Bagnani. In an article published in 1960, uh, Bagnani stated, uh, an object may be declared a fake because it is much too good to be true, or it is much too bad to be true, or because it is like countless other objects, or because it is not like any known object or because it, it confirms an established theory, or because it explodes an established theory, and so on and so forth. Um, so <laughs> I think that Pagnani consciously gave a self-contradictory definition of forgery, through which she meant to show that forgeries have always existed and have always been created for very different purposes. So they're uh, often very difficult and to label and identify. Today, after centuries of classical scholarship, this, the shift in concepts of fakes and forgeries still represent a central aspect of the study of the Greek and Roman world. And even in my field, that of classical epigraphy, the role of forged texts and monuments is extremely um, strong and complex. Um, the tendency to forge um, inscriptions already existed in ancient Rome as early as in the mid fifth century BCE. Uh, in a passage of Livy's book four, you can see it on your screen, uh, we learn that a forged inscription, uh, Livy calls it falsus titulus, was produced to demonstrate that Lucius Minucius had been a tribune of the plebs early in his career and in 438 BCE. Um, but what exactly is a forged inscription? It is difficult to offer a straight answer. Let me offer another example. Um, in 14th century Padua, a Roman funeral inscription was discovered commemorating a man called Titus Livius. This person was immediately identified with the Roman historian Livy, who was known to have been a native of Padua. The inscription was praised by humanists, even by Petrarch, and became the object of civic and intellectual devotion. It was eventually displayed, where you can see it in this picture here, in the main room of the uh, town hall of the city, where it still hangs today. Only in the 16th century did scholars begin to realize that its text just commemorated a freed man called Titus Livius Halis and not the ancient historian. But is this inscription a forgery? Of course, it's not. It is a genuine inscription whose interpretation was somehow forged or rather forced for a specific ideological purpose. Um, in, the 16, in the 15th and 16th centuries, the creation of epigraphic forgeries became more and more frequent. Um, well-known forgers like Annius of Viterbo and uh, Piero Ligorio um, produced thousands of false inscriptions, both on paper and on durable materials like stone or metal. Humanists began to realize that the diffusion of forgeries was particularly related with two factors. First, the impossibility of carrying out a personal inspection of the inscription, what we call today the autopsy, and the fact that inscribed objects are often brought from one place to another. 
In the late 1400s, Fra Giocondo was the first who understood the importance of carrying out an autopsy of, ins of the inscribed monuments, um, while he, he, transcribed, uh, he transcribed them in his epigraphic manuscripts. Um, in the mid 16th century, Martin Desmet complained about the mobility of objects and monuments, which were frequently displaced from one antiquarian collection to another. Around the same time, thanks to the discovery of some juridical inscriptions on bronze and of the Capitoline Fasti in Rome, scholars began to realize that inscriptions could serve as antiquarian sources, meaning that they could be used for better understanding ancient history and integrating the narrative of ancient historians, such as Livy. Um, the Flemish scholar Ian Grutter first attempted to publish a universal corpus of all the Greek and Latin inscriptions we, which were known in his days. This volume included approximately, approximately 12,000 texts. So it was an amazing and pioneering enterprise, yet it was also rather faulty since Grutter never personally checked the inscribed monuments uh, that he published. On the contrary, he reproduced earlier editions of epigraphic texts or uh, new transcriptions, which uh, he received by mail, thanks to a huge network of uh, correspondents all over Europe. Grutter was also the first to devote a specific uh, section of his corpus to forgeries. At the end of this massive volume, he collected a group of about 200 spurious inscriptions. Yet there are many more false texts throughout his work, which he did not recognize as such. Around the mid 18th century, Scipione Maffei, a learned nobleman from Verona, was the first to draw a set of rules for recognizing forged inscriptions. Um, Maffei had developed a compulsive passion uh, for Greek and Latin epigraphy, and his Decalogue uh, strikes us for being incredibly modern. Um, first of all, as an indispensable rule, Maffei clearly states that a good epigraphist must carry out autopsy of all inscribed monuments, what he calls uh, marmorum inspectio. He then calls for a close examination of the contents of inscriptions, verba ac continentia, for an impeccable uh, transcription of each sign and uh, inscriptiones recte describendae, um, for extreme carefulness in expanding abbreviations, um, summa diligentia resolvendae, um, as well as in proposing emendations and integrations, inscriptiones summa circunscriptione emendandae vel supplendae. So um, he also reminded, him, reminded us of the difficulty of translating inscriptions, especially those written in Greek, the versio. And he finally maintains the importance of petrographic and paleographic analysis, what he calls marmoris genus, faces, coloremque, and scripturae observatio and judicium literarum. Um, Maffei even displayed some fake inscription in his private museum in Verona so that they could serve as a sort of teaching aid. Yet, despite his attempts to isolate forgeries, their number kept increasing well into the 19th century. Um, in a letter written to the uh, young Danish scholar uh, Olaus Kellerman in 1835, the great Italian epigraphist Bartolomeo Borghesi complimented on the former's intention of setting up a corpus of Latin, of Latin inscriptions. In the first place, because such a work would eventually help scholars to get rid of thousands of impostures and forged texts, which were still circulating in their days. Um, Kellerman died young, and his project was revived by Theodor Mommsen, who gave way to uh, a new science, namely epigraphic criticism. 
Mumsen fully described this method in his proposal for a corpus inscriptionum latinarum, which he addressed to the Berlin Academy of Sciences in 1847. A full paragraph of his uh, text was devoted to the critique of authenticity. In Mumsen view, there were three different kinds of epigraphic forgeries those deceitfully produced by antique dealers, those created by local scholars, usually just on paper to celebrate their homeland, and third, those fabricated by professional forgers, which were also the most difficult to detect. And this was the case of uh, Ligorio, towards whom both Borghese and Mommsen had uh, developed a real uh, aversion. Uh, Mommsen put in place his principles in the edition of the Latin inscriptions from the Kingdom of Naples, published in 1852. In his introduction to the work, which was dedicated to Borghese, he developed his own set of rules for dealing with untrustworthy epigraphic documents. Uh, Mumpson's assumption was that inscriptions are in the first place fundamental documents for the study of the past. In his positivist view, history had to be an exact science, but in order to be so, it had to be written using objective and reliable primary sources. The latter included the texts of Greek and Latin authors, but also, and perhaps above all, the text of ancient inscriptions, which have come to us directly without the mediation of medieval copyists. It is well worth reading the rules which uh, Mommsen set in treating epigraphic uh, forgeries, because after over 150 years, they're still very, very influential. Mm, so I will perhaps read them in English translation, but you have the original text in front of you. The first, I included in my corpus all the inscriptions, the ones that I saw and the ones that I did not see, the unpublished ones and the ones that were previously published, no matter in, in what way, the genuine ones, the suspect ones, and the fake ones. Second rule, the very first goal of the volume was to separate genuine inscriptions from forgeries. In the third rule, uh, Momsen, who was a jurist, recognized the principle of the so-called presumption of innocence, dolum non presumi. But he also stated that once the deceitful intent of an author had been proven, his entire credibility as a source was invalidated and his whole production must be labeled as forged. This is really a crucial point, which comes in, uh, also in the following point, in point number four. He says, I did not prosecute single inscriptions, but single authors, meaning that he challenged the trustworthiness of the whole production of those who had transcribed inscriptions. We can call it the principle of the unreliability of the first witness. If the earliest transcription of an inscription comes from an author who had been identified as a forger, then no matter its contents, such an inscription must be false. So in other words, Mommsen discarded the whole production of certain authors like Ligorio, because he simply had no time for checking that all the inscriptions that uh, these authors had copied were genuine or, or false. He states that very clearly. And his conclusion is semel fur, semper fur. <laughs> Once a thief, always a thief. And also that it is better to uh, to keep a genuine inscription among the forgeries than the other way around. This is also very important because many inscriptions have been uh, re-evaluated uh, recently. Um, it is important to bear in mind that Momsen decided to devote a specific section of his corpus to fake inscriptions. And in doing so, some fundamental help was offered by the decision of following a geographical order in presenting inscriptions. Um, apparently, yes, you can see it here, inscriptiones falsae vel suspectae, um, Momsen initially designed a sort of double degree of uh, jurisdiction, falsae and suspectae, and this distinction also appears in a letter written in 1881, 
where uh, these two categories are called hell and purgatory of inscriptions. As a matter of fact, um, in the CIL, this section was simply labeled as falsae, so he got rid of the suspectae, and was paired with another category, that of the alienae, meaning those inscriptions which are kept in a place different from that for which they were originally conceived. The fact that both these categories, falsae and alienae, are marked by an asterisk uh, may often generate confusion among the non-specialists. Yet it is quite clear why Momsen decided to pair them, because in his view, both of these categories could not be used as sources for historical uh, reconstruction. So I hope that this overview of the history of scholarship on epigraphic forgeries was useful to make you understand how diversified and capricious the section of the falsi in the CIL is. It should be, stret it should be stressed that it is a huge section. Um, you can see some figures here taken from a, a recent uh, doctoral dissertation. And uh, like I said, Momsen's approach was very influential uh, also for later corpora like the Inscriptiones Graecae. So what about today? Do we still believe in Momsen's inflexible attitude? Um, in a recent study, an Italian colleague, Alfredo Bonopane, suggested a more thorough distinction within the undiversified uh, Mare Magnum of Momsen's falsae. And you can see it here in the slide. According to Bonopane, we can recognize fakes, meaning consciously counterfeited inscriptions made for profit, profit or, fraud, or fraud, replicas, meaning more or less faithful reproductions made for studying, collecting, exhibiting, or conservation purposes, but not for deceiving, and re-elaborations. So modern inscriptions, which were produced by altering the text of one or more ancient inscriptions. Um, so uh, Bonopane's idea is that we should uh, try to understand the intent of the forger, but this is not always easy to, uh, to do. So to conclude this uh, first part of my talk, I would like to give you just some information on the research project that I coordinate. Just some figures here. It started about four years ago. It involves about 50 scholars for, from 12 public universities located all over Italy. These are its key points. And I would like to stress especially uh, point number two, the creation of uh, a, a digital resource for epigraphic forgeries, which is uh, accessible online. We have already um, registered, recorded about 1,500 uh, forged texts. And I hope that within a month or so, we should have an English version of the database available too. So it's now in Italian, but we have an English version ready that should be online very, very soon. Um, and these are also some... Um, uh, conferences and publications that stem of, from the uh, project. They're all available in open access, so the PDFs of the volumes are downloadable for free. All right, um, let's get to the second part of the talk, uh, which is going to be about a case study um, from a a small archaeological museum in the northern Venetian lagoon in the island of Torcello. Um, there one can still see a small rectangular bronze tablet displayed inside a glass, a glass case uh, where it is labeled as a genuine inscription with a dedication to Drusus the Younger, the son of Emperor Tiberius, who died in 23 CE, causing much grief to his father. Uh, the front part of the tablet bears the text of the dedication, while the back, as you can see, carries some single or double letters, which are not easy to expand or uh, understand, actually. Um, the genuineness, of, well, this is the um, record of the inscription in the EDF, just to show you how it is like. I hope you can see it. It's quite rich, it's quite rich, the description. Um, the genuineness 
of the uh, object is, in my view, challenged by at least four elements, or rather five, which I was able to detect after an accurate inspection. First, it's peculiarity. In fact, this tablet does not belong to any of the well-known categories of the so-called instrumentum inscriptum. It is not a tabula lusoria, a game board. It is not a tessera hospitalis, a hospitality token, nor a tessera numularia, a bronze tag for money changers. It is not a signaculum, a stamp, because it is not written in reverse order and it has no handle. Um, likewise, it is not able to be attached to an object because it is written on both sides. Um, and it was not tied to an object since it has no hole. Um, so it is quite impossible to define the typology of this artifact, which for the sake of simplicity, which we shall simply call a tablet. Uh, second point, it's punctuation. Punctuation marks are located at the beginning and at the end of the lines at various heights. And this is not how the Romans usually punctuated their texts. Third, the sequence of single letters on the back uh, cannot identify with, with any of the abbreviations commonly used for Latin epigraphy in the early imperial times. And fourth, uh, the dimensions and the weight of the uh, object do not correspond to ancient Roman units. And this is quite a strong argument in my view in favor of the falseness of these objects. Indeed, to these four considerations, one might add one final point, that of seriality. Uh, seriality and repetitiveness can often be identified as markers of forgery. Forgers often fab fabricated more than one sample of their counterfeit products which may now be inadvertently considered to be uh, genuine artifacts in different parts of the world, for instance, in two archaeological museums. So of course, there are inscriptions which were produced in more than one copy in ancient times. But generally speaking, one should always be cautious when identical or even slightly different texts can be found on different uh, physical objects. And this final aspect was already remarked in the 1990s when a similar tablet was detected by a colleague, uh, Antonio Sartori, who saw it on sale in a shop in Paris. This second tablet was sold on the antiquarian market, so we don't know where it is today. And we only have a cast of it on kitchen foil, which was made for uh, my colleague by the art dealer. Actually, a long investigation carried out both in libraries and in museums across Europe has led me to discover that the copies of this inscribed tablet are not only two, but several. Uh, some of them are still existing, while others are known only through manuscript tradition. So far, aside from the Torcello tablet and the Lost Paris tablet, I was able to locate three more copies of the same inscription. Um, one in Arezzo, mm, one in Madrid, and one more in Basel. Uh, to these three objects, one may add some others, which were published in different parts of the uh, CIL, of the Corpus Inscriptionum Latinarum, where they were unanimously judged as forged. In particular, the uh, 11th volume of the corpus, published by Eugen Bormann and devoted to inscriptions from Aemilia and Etruria, so from central northern Italy, is very rich with information. Uh, Bormann had spotted a group of nine small um, bronze tablets inscribed with different texts um, in Bologna. Uh, that's the entry that you're looking at now. And he defined them, um, I'm translating from the Latin, several bronze tablets inscribed with false copies of genuine inscriptions. Tabelle ere inscripte, exemplis falsis titulorum geninorum. Uh, well, he mentioned that he had personally seen them in the Archaeological Museum in Bologna, while formerly, formerly they belonged to the university collection of the same city. 
and you can see among these inscriptions in the fifth position a copy of the dedication to Drusus. Unfortunately, despite numerous attempts, it has been impossible to locate this group of tablets, which brings up another point for discussion in my view. What happens to forgeries once they are recognized as such, even if they're kept in a public museum? Unfortunately, until not long ago, it was quite frequent to get rid of objects which were um, labeled as forged. And in this specific case, it is quite uh, possible that Bormann's judgment served as a death sentence for those nine uh, inscriptions. Um, further information comes from another uh, chapter of CIL 11 devoted to the city of Pistoia in northern uh, Tuscany. Uh, we can find an entry, CIL 11209 uh, with an asterisk, of course, because it's among the false, right? where Bormann registered a group of forged inscriptions which had once belonged to a learned local man, uh, Francesco Ignazio Merlini Calderini, who claimed to have found them in the countryside near Pistoia in, 16, um, in 1763. Now, in Bormann's view, the element that condemned these objects as false was, once again, their repetitiveness. Qui has et similes tabellas fecit falsarius expressit fere inscriptiones genuinas con plura autem fecit exemplaria. Um, So, according to Bormann, you can see it in the slide, a number of these bronze tablets circulated among, circulated among the members of the Academia Columbaria, a learned society established in Florence, in Florence uh, since the 1730s. Um, Bormann also reminded the readers of the CIL that Merlini Calderini had produced a print reproduction of the four tablets. This document was long thought to be lost, but I was recently able to identify a unique copy of it in the State Archives in Florence. So what, well, that's the Columbaria. Yes, in the State Archive in Florence, uh, this document was attached to a set of letters sent by Merlini Calderini. Uh, well, you can read this text in the slide where you can find a rich account of the way in which Merlini got hold of his tablets. Um, from this text, it is quite clear that Merlini was convinced of the genuineness of these objects and that he used them to demonstrate the importance of his hometown Pistoia in Roman times. Merlini also mentions that he had acquired the tablets from a young foreigner he calls it a knickknacks ambulant vendor who used to travel between Tuscany and the Kingdom of Naples. And it would be very interesting to know more about this character who wandered around Italy selling inscribed forgeries in the mid 1700s. Now, according to Bormann, the bronze objects that we're, uh, that we're dealing with carried nothing but the transcription of genuine inscriptions. Um, that's the printed um, sheet that I was able to find in the state archive, unique copy. Um, so what were the models of these four inscriptions? Some of them are easy to identify. For instance, the first inscription reproduced uh, a copy of a genuine dedication to Germanicus and two of his sons which was carved on a marble slab and was already known in Rome in the 16th century. And you can see that the, um, the forger did not understand that the original text was organized on three columns. So he simply transcribed them as if, as if the lines were written continuously. The models for the second and the third tablets are more difficult to identify. In fact, there are several dedications, dedications to Drusus the Younger and to Titus, and uh, their text was already known in the uh, mid 18th century. So uh, the, pro the prototype, the model is not easy to identify. Finally, the 
model for the fourth tablet is, on the contrary, clearly recognizable uh, with the text inscribed on a, a massive marble funerary uh, altar with a dedication to uh, um, Friedman, the Iberius Julius Messner. Uh, and this altar comes from Rome, but it then belonged to the collection of the Medici family, so it was later brought to uh, Florence, where it is still kept in the uh, Boboli Gardens by the Palazzo Pitti. So the story that I told you uh, somehow reminding, reminded me of a detective novel, and therefore, in order to conclude, I have decided to draw uh, my conclusions in the form of the classical five W's questions. First, what? What are we dealing with? Certainly, the text of the dedication to Drusus, as well as those uh, inscribed on the other tablets, were not invented from scratch, but actually reproduced, sometimes with major mistakes, the texts of genuine Latin inscriptions, which were already known uh, by the mid 1700s. Who? Um, Currently, the identity of the forger who produced the tablets is unknown. Could he be the same person who sold them to Merlini Calderin in Pistoia, these knick-knack dealers who was going back and forth from the Kingdom of Naples? When, um, in the absence of further evidence, it is only possible to trace back the history of these tablets to the moment when they were first attested. So this leads us to 1763, when the tablets were first sold to Merlini Calderini. And it should be uh, stressed that in the same year, six more tablets were sold to another member of the Accademia Colombaria in Florence. Where, similarly, we can only go backward in time and acknowledge that the first 10 tablets, so four in Pistoia and six in Florence, were bought by two different persons in Tuscany. But however, we sh it should be stressed that the man who sold the tablets to Merlini in Pistoia allegedly went back and forth from Tuscany to the Kingdom of Naples. So an origin from Southern Italy is also possible. And you must bear in mind that this is the time when the first excavations in uh, Pompeii and Herculaneum took place. And also when forgeries began to appear in the local antiquarian market in Naples. Finally, the most important and difficult question, why? What was the purpose of the person who produced the tablets? Were they actual forgeries whose intent was to deceive their purchasers or were they a sort of souvenir whose intent, uh, which were made you know, for, uh, for the grand tourers, for instance, with no pretension of being ancient? Perhaps the back of the tablets uh, which uh, is always inscribed with those unusual abbreviations, carries a specific message which may offer a solution to some of these doubts. Unfortunately, so far it was impossible to decipher those abbreviated letters. And I really <laughs> look forward to any suggestion. So a more complete answer is likely to come only from further interdisciplinary investigation. In fact, I believe that the time has come to stop considering forgeries simply as spurious documents, which scholars should isolate and expunge. Uh, in my view, forgeries should rather be treated as the cultural products of the time when they were produced and as objects which interact with the different contexts where they circulate. We may even go as far as to say that when properly identified as such, Forgeries also get the right to be labeled as primary sources. Of course, primary sources for the time when they were produced. And in fact, their value as documentary evidence for cultural history and for the study of the uses of the past cannot be underestimated. This is why it is absolutely worthwhile to keep chasing and investigating them. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>